you. So they want to start a bit broader. And they asked you yesterday already what other problems you would solve in a quantum computer. So what if I give you today a quantum computer with 1,000 good fast logical qubits? What would you do with it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Consciousness. Great. How would you solve a quantum, how would you use a quantum computer for consciousness? <laughs> Great question. How would you use a quantum computer to solve that? Let's say I give you one here, I give you cloud access to a 1,000 logical qubit, 10,000 logical qubit quantum computer. What would you, what would you do? <laughs> Okay, and then I give you a quantum-inspired optimizer to do it. So let's talk about, about that at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you do? Are you interested in, qu in quantum computers? Yeah, so if I gave you one, what would you do with it? Hmm? You would solve, solve superconductivity problems. How? How would you solve it? I'll tell you later. <laughs> what else? Cryptography, yes. How many qubits would you want to have? How many do you want for that? Yeah. I know something better. <laughs> With 2,330 qubits, you can break Bitcoin. And then you can steal all the Bitcoin. I think that's worth more than a single credit card. Good, so let's say 1,000 qubits at uh, megahertz logical frequencies. So so uh, one logical gate per microsecond. Let's assume that, and it can run for a year. Yeah. So it has, let's say, about 10 to the 14. Yes. What would you do with that? Yeah. We would steal all of the, all of the bitcoins, and then we fund our program. Great. But after that, people will not use those crypto uh, systems anymore, so it's a one-time thing. And after that, uh, you're richer than it just retire. <laughs> what else do you want to do? Simulate the universe. How many qubits? In 10,000 qubits. <laughs> Superconductivity and strongly interacting system. Yes, that is. What else can we do with it? Hmm? Hmm? Optimization. We talked about that yesterday. We can do it great with quantum-inspired classical methods. Of course, with 10,000, then we can maybe get the further speed, but not much, because it's that quadratic. So it gives you a little bit more. Which optimization problems would you solve? Yeah? But Pepe, you may need more than 10,000 qubits. <laughs> So we're looking to that, and the problem is that for most optimization problems, you don't need the best solution. You just need one that is good enough. And for example, for the traveling salesman problem, if you want to solve a problem with 100,000 cities, which is pretty big, then to encode that, you need 10 to the 10 qubits, so many, many more than that. 
but on your laptop you can approximate this within one second to 99%, 99.9% 9 of the best solution. And you don't care about the extra 0.1% typically. So many problems we can solve well enough. So it has to be a small one that's super hard and hard to, 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 to approximate. So it's still looking for those. What do you think? Rock design. Excellent. That's a great discussion to be had. But it comes up quite often. How would you use a quantum computer for drug design? You try to, to simulate the molecule. Okay, that's a great point. I'll come back to that later. Because why can't you do it on a classical computer? If you use Caparnello uh, molecular dynamics, then you get the forces from a full quantum some calculation using LDA. And so the, the, the nuclei, you can typically treat as classical particles for a drug because it's pretty warm. So you can do a one of Pestenheimer approximation, and then we can, ca and then we need to calculate the forces, right? And we can do that approximately with the density functional theory. And why is that not good enough? The, no, the problem is even molecular dynamics is order of magnitude too slow for drug design on a classical computer. So the problem is not accuracy, the problem there is speed. So we looked into that, we talked about that to the to, 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 to experts there, and they radically simplify the model and it's still good enough. Because most drugs are built from, from the mega, mega to organic molecules, carbon, maybe carbon, maybe hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur maybe. That has P and S orbitals, but not D orbitals. And then correlation effects are weak, and then DFT is good enough, typically. So it's accurate enough, but it's too slow. And now we propose to replace it by an even slower, even more accurate calculation. I'd say yes, once you make drugs with iron in there, or copper, nickel, or something, then you'll need it. But they don't do that yet. So where, where people have proposed that it can be used in drug design is you have to kind of find out which the, the, the substances are make up the, make up the potential drug. And then we can try with machine learning. And so you can say maybe can you do a quantum AI? Maybe that comes back to consciousness. And so can you learn more with a quantum network than, than with the classical one, and can quantum networks maybe give you better candidate drugs than classical networks? That's one way how we could use it. But just for the chemistry uh, simulation, it's unlikely. So yeah, you see, there are many problems that are super hard, like drug design, that one has to dig into what is the bottleneck, we find out here, here, here this is the speed of an approximate classical calculation. So it's uh, not something for quantum. While for per conductivity, if you want the better the HTC compound, there's, uh, there may be iron in there or copper and so on, then there are mega correlation effects. And then, DFT is not good enough. So there we need something more accurate, and I don't care if it's slow. Okay, yeah, that's perfect, but we'll have to look then whether it's doable in finite time. Yeah. When you have D orbitals, they are smaller than the S. The 
S is big. So, so uh, uh, electrons can uh, uh, avoid each other. D and F get narrower and smaller, so they're closer. And then uh, they have to be, be uh, correlated to uh, avoid the Coulomb uh, interaction. So it's more when you take 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 the the s orbitals, the overlaps are big, so the kinetic terms are much stronger than the Coulomb terms. When you have p, it's still when you have d, they are roughly balanced, and that's when it gets interesting. The most interesting material actually is plutonium. Because it sits right on the phase transition between a metal and uh, the, the mod insulator. And there are transitions there where when you change the temperature a little bit, the volume changes by 37% as you go from a metal to a mega, 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 mega fluid insulator. Just by tiny correlation effects. Of course, we don't want to simulate the plutonium too much, typically, or talk about it. How we build a quantum computer to simulate plutonium, well, that would be bad <laughs> press. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's, uh, that shows kind of the effects that happen when the the the, 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 the Coulomb interaction is balanced with the kinetics. Yeah. Nuclear physics is an excellent question. People have started to look into that. The question is, how do you want to describe it? If you want to describe it as in the, in the through effective models, then you have two body, three body, four body, five body, and uh, no. The small interactions will see with your chemistry later how two body is already tough. So you would rather want to simulate it at the level of, of uh, the gauge theory. That has to be worked out how many qubits you need there. People did simple the, the toy models or the, 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 the theorem, but scaling that up is. So yes, let's add nuclear physics to it. What else? Linear algebra. What problem would you solve in linear algebra? Or where wo would you apply it? Made in the world. Yes, let me come to that point later. Good point. Yes, there is exponential speed that involved in some linear systems of equations. Anything else? You see, we, we talk so much about quantum computing. And you come here because you're interested in it, and you have a hard time finding lots of applications. Machine learning is another one. Why? Yeah, we'll come to that and why that that approach is not the best, but you can use an optimizer because training is basically optimization. So that may be something, but if it's a big network, you will need a large quantum computer with more than 10,000 qubits. But what is interesting in uh, <laughs> machine learning is that you can build quantum models that can learn certain data exponentially better than a classical network can ever learn. And the one example that I like to, uh, to bring there, or it, it may be, it be the only one where it's known to be true, is if you have somebody build a quantum computer 
with let's say 100 good qubits. And out comes a quantum state, psi. And they use that to for a quantum supremacy experiment. They want to uh, produce a state here with 100 qubits that you cannot predict classically. So that is the one, the one you, so, and then by the definition of quantum supremacy, no classical computer can ever predict the state that comes out, right? So let's say we have here quantum supremacy experiment. But now, let's assume I also have a 100 qubit quantum computer. Then I can train my 100 qubit quantum computer to also pr produce some state psi prime. And I can play with my, this, 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 this my circuit here, with my quantum neural network, my quantum AI. My quantum AI can actually perfectly reproduce it once I've guessed or learned the right circuit. And when I have a quantum circuit in here, it gives me a state that no classical computer can ever predict. You know, so no classical neural network can predict. But if I know the circuit, if I guess it right, if I learn it right, then my quantum computer with the same 100 qubits can reproduce the state perfectly. I just have to find the same circuit. So uh, that shows us that a quantum neural network or a quantum AI can actually perfectly learn quantum states that no classical computer can ever learn. And that's how we know that quantum <laughs> neural networks or quantum models for AI are exponentially more powerful than classical ones, at least for learning quantum data. The big open question is, is there other data like in drug design or elsewhere that you can learn better? And we don't know yet. That needs to be explored. It's, it's hard to prove things here because most of the classical AI models are also just, just an empirical model. It just works for some reason that nobody understands. You, you cannot prove that it can work. You can find cases where it does not work, but in practice it works pretty well most of the time. So we'll have to use quantum models. Once we have qubits, we have to, 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 to try to see what they can learn and what network can learn things well and how do we train it well and so on. This, this classically took decades, quantumly, well, we have time. Yeah. Yes, that's a separate topic. I can use it for a quantum repeater, for example, for quantum networks that I build up here. We can use it for secure communication. If it costs a few billion to build a quantum computer, who will give you the money for which application? There may be something here, right? If we get a room temperature superconductor, that pays for it all. If we break Bitcoin, that, <laughs> that pays for it all. If we should find a new drug that's useful, that pays for it totally. We just don't know yet how to do that. Linear algebra, there may be a bit of problems here. But then, I'd say the big market in classical computing is social networks and games. So if you can actually convince all of the teenagers of this world that they need a quantum computer because they want to entangle their qubits with their friends' qubits, <laughs> that's the much bigger market. So we need quantum toys and quantum games. We want you to, to, to think about that. Th that's the real market. But so we have some problems and we see it's not many. Well, we don't know much in many cases, but that's what we have to start now. As we build quantum computers, we have to start thinking about what will the letters do. 
yes, it's a great machine that uses quantum superposition and it can be zero and one at the same time and we tell all those stories. But people still think it's just something like the smartphone, just exponentially faster and it's not that, right? So we need to find out kind of what are the problems that people care about that we solve with it. And so first, or the step zero, is to find the problems. And then as I catch yesterday, so step zero is find an interesting problem. Find a hard, interesting problem. Because if I can solve it on a classical computer, I don't care about it. Now here, my guess, they say, is always building a quantum computer will cost billions of dollars. That is simply based on the fact that Intel spends $1 billion to develop the next version of their CPU. NVIDIA spends $1 billion to develop the next version of their GPUs. Building a fab for a classical chip costs on the order of $10 billion. If you want to build a quantum computer, it will, in the end, the scalable one, the big one, will not be cheaper. So the cost will be billion. And so I can just as well spend a billion dollars on building a special purpose classical computer. So I want to find a hard and interesting problem that, that I cannot solve on a classical computer if I gave you a billion dollars to build a special purpose machine. That's the competition. I don't want to discuss whether D-Wave is faster than my laptop or not. That's not the right comparison. If we're spending hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, that's the hardware that I should compare to. So, but we have some hard problems where we just have no idea how to solve them well enough classically. We, we're done with that. The next, I mentioned yesterday, find a quantum algorithm with speed up. With quantum speed up. That's not necessary, as we saw, because the quantum annealer had no proven quantum speed up, and it led to extremely interesting new classical uh, uh, algorithms that are extremely useful and have impact already today. But it's not quantum, it's classical. So then after that, okay, so where do we do that? I think we can just look at, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, at the the quantum soup by Stephen Jordan. There are lots of uh, algorithms that one can in principle use. Now the question is how do we map them to one of those problems? You will not find something here for curing cancer, so we have to, 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 to be smarter. And then the next step two is implement the oracle. and check speed up. And there I mentioned yesterday already the case of Grover search. Where if you want to look in a, in a phone book, that the single Curie call has to read the whole phone book and have to do the square root of n times. So when I want to read it from a real database, when I have to do classical IO from classical data, the speed of vanishes in Grover search because the quantum oracle is a factor n more expensive than the classical one. And so Grover search is still useful, but only if I can calculate the data on the fly. So quantum RAM is a great suggestion because quantum RAM is basically you say you can build something to load data. Yes. How do you build it? Yes, you can build quantum RAM, namely you can load it in logarithmic time in the data size by just building a tree. You have all your data down here. And then I load it into qubit in a tree-like structure. And at the end, I have here my quantum state in my log n qubits. In depth log n, I can build it. How much hardware does it need? This needs big O of n hardware. Or actually, 
if I want to load, yeah, so if I want to load a vector, it takes big O of n hardware. With big and, and to load log n qubit. With big O of n hardware, I can simulate log n qubits efficiently on a classical computer, right? So if I, build, if I use this hardware and, and I do it classically, then I do go search in log n time classically because I build just broadcast what I look for, it, I get the answer back in log n time classically. So the problem is if you build this quantum RAM to load the data, then you need exponential hardware. That's what you should compare to, then it can do it classically. The speed up is exponential, but I use exponential hardware. I then also get exponential speed up classically. I can find it in log n time classically by building the same type of hardware. So, so, so here, here you you load the data in in log n time. Yes, but if you give me this tree structure classically, then I do the the search in log n time classically. Let's say I want to know which box is the number forty two in. I send the, the, the number maybe forty kit kit two down the network the tree. And then this is box three, so it sends up the index three, and it has found it in log n time. Or even simpler, with O n hardware, I can simulate a gate operation on log n qubits in constant time. So I can just simulate the quantum algorithm. If you give me exponential hardware, then I get exponential speed up classically through this parallelism. you have to be careful to always compare also to the same scaling of the classical hardware and, say, and see what could I do with that much classical hardware. And I have classical hardware in there for the control of every single qubit. So the only way it can work if you do not build big O of N hardware, if you say, let's do it just analog passively. Seth Lloyd likes to hold up a CD and says, and and the laser pointer and say, let us shine a photon onto the CD. It hits the whole CD and it comes out containing all the information in the CD. The problem is this is analog. There will be the errors that they cannot correct. Once I add the quantum error correction, I need the, the figure of an hardware. Or you can say, let's take a hard disk and let's put the read head in the quantum superposition of all possible so t t t t t t positions. I think you agree that this is t t t unlikely to work. So you may be able to build it t t t analog up to a certain limited size when the photon loss becomes too big or when, it's or when the read head is no longer in a uh, superposition of, let's say, 10 places. So that's not scalable. To be scalable, you need to uh, error correct it, and then you need exponential hardware. So yes, we implement the Oracle, but then if you use exponential hardware quantumly, give me exponential hardware classically, and, and we compare. So whenever I see a paper in there that says I need QRAM, this is it. Then I look extremely closely whether the use for QRAM is the limiting factor. And in grow it is. Because I can do it in log n time. Yes, yeah, so you see classically I can do it in log n time because I need to do one search in here. Quantumly I need log n times square root n to get an exponential speed up. So with that machine, I get an exponential speed up on the classical computer over Grover search. So there's already in, in one search that has log n time in the tree compared to square root of n calls to the, the Oracle. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point. With QRAM, I get exponential speed up 
uh, or it gets exponential quantum slowdown. So, so this is, I just want to load data into a vector. So I just want to load a wave function into to, 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 to log in qubit. That I can do with a tree. No, you see, you need to feed n numbers in because uh, the wave function of uh, the log n qubit has n numbers. And so I cannot do that with less than the than n complexity because I need to feed every single number into it somehow. So the, 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 the circuit volume has to be at least n. And if I just do it in time log n, then I have to have this order n width. Now, I think in general even, if I want to load, load a wave function of log n qubits, let's say of 10 qubits from 1,024 numbers, then I need to feed those 1,024 numbers into the circuit. And thus, the, uh, and thus 1,024 is a lower bound on my circuit volume. I have to feed in every single number, and it can't go faster than that. Yes, classical data. Yes. Yes, so when this comes from a quantum computer, then it may work. Let's say it comes from a quantum circuit or quantum measurement, then it's fine. If it's study test, but you have to be able to calculate it fast in a time that's faster than root n or you don't have a speed up, right? So that's what I mean, it's useful if you can calculate it efficiently on the fly. If it's quantum data that you uh, compute in a big calculation, then it's not useful because you cannot clone the quantum data, right? So you have, so it has to be an efficient fast circuit. So with global search, that's what we look for. Then there's another application that I did not hear. Yes, namely there's a nice paper by uh, Lee Dar and others who looked at page rank. Can you do the search engine ranking better on a quantum computer? That's a big application and they found a quantum algorithm for that. And what I like about the paper is that they really went through all details and spelled out how they could actually implement it. So they said they can, can so uh, what page, uh, page uh, the tit, uh, the tit rank does is you have to calculate the largest eigenvalue and this uh, eigenvector of the big matrix. And you do that by making uh, the matrix that has uh, has uh, 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 entry i j whenever the web page i links to web page j and now you have to implement the time evolution under that matrix and in uh, general that's hard but they said it's much easier if instead of log n qubits you assume n qubits and make a unary encoding where always only just one qubit is set to one, uh, the others are zero. And then they could show that one can actually implement a page rank by implementing the time evolution under this spin model here, which only has the two body terms in it. It's a simple spin model under which one has to evolve. And then they show that with that, you can solve page rank in a time that scales with n to the power of 0 0.2. In the best case, it may, it may be 1, but it could be n to the power of 0 0.2. 
but you need to have all of these n squared couplings here implemented in hardware in parallel. Then the time complexity is you know, just 50 n to the 0.2. While classically, I do page rank by making a constant number like 10 matrix vector multiplications with the, 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 the same matrix. And the, the complexity for each is the, 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 the sparsity, which is the, 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 the mean link number times the number of, per, per, per of web pages. So you have the, the, the big O of D times N classically compared to big O of the, 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 the N to the, 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 the 0 0.2 quantum link. And thus they argue there's quantum speed up. What's nice is that they really explicitly spelled out how to do it and calculate it all. And if we now look at that with what we just learned and see they use n squared hardware in parallel compared to this is the total gate count, not assuming the parallelism yet. So, l so let us compare that. And for the, so, and let's assume we do it serially, classically and quantumly. Then quantumly, uh, uh, the scaling becomes n squared per time step because I have n squared couplers. Classically, to do the, the matrix vector multiplication, I need time, time to get up the, the n log n, get n when it's sparse. And if I build special hardware, I could bring it down to the big O of n. Memory is always about n qubits or bits. When I do it parallel, they've shown they can bring it down to about the n to the 0 0.2. Classically, if I take a general purpose hardware that builds a 3D cubic lattice, the time is n to the one third. If like in the quantum case where they have couplers between every single pair of qubits, I build a classical machine with cables between every single pair of nodes in my computer, then I bring the time down to log n. With because the matrix is fast, big O of n hardware compared to big O of n squared hardware quantumly. So uh, when we say let's build a special purpose quantum machine to solve that, we should also look at, can we build a special purpose classical machine to solve the same using the same hardware? In this case, we find that even with less hardware, we get exponential speed up. So the, yes, they had a speed up, but the speed up in this case was the parallelism speed up of using n squared hardware again. So when you think about building a special purpose quantum computer, let's think about building a special purpose classical computer. And by the way, the log n here is wrong, asymptotically. Does somebody know why? Why can you, why, uh, why is, so what is the lower bound for any calculation that needs n data? There's a, there's, there's a proof of lower bound of n to the power of one third due to, to the, the speed of light. You have to store your data in volume that scales with the data and if the computation needs all data, the time has to be at least n to the power of one third. Okay, so that's a provable lower bound in a relativistic universe. So that's the statement about log n asymptotic scaling. I think it's a good approximation for some problems. Has, have some of you seen the old K1 and K2 supercomputers and XMP and YMP? Like they, they build them in a cylinder to make the cables shorter because of your speed of, uh, of your uh, mega light beam. So it is of practical relevance. Okay, so then let's look at linear systems of equation that was mentioned. Yeah. Yes, but okay, then 
yeah, so you can say it's the number of, of operations, but then the bigger n gets, the lower your, the more time you need per operation. Yeah, so if you say it's the, it's the number of operations you need, then yes, you have to, if you want to map it to a time complexity, then the time grows with n to the one third. Or if you say you build a network and you have an op uh, operation that you you use you you, you uh, send the data a uh, fixed distance in space, then the the the, the fixed operation count increases. Yeah. Okay. So linear systems was mentioned. One can solve a linear system in logarithmic time as long as you can evolve efficiently under the matrix A. So I need to evolve under exponential of minus I A T. And now we see immediately if this A is an, is an N times N matrix, that's classical data that I load from my hard disk, then the time complexity for that is at least N squared because I have to load that data. Because again, the uh, same problem, I need a QRAM to load that, and then that's n squared. And in n squared time, I can solve a linear system classically. So the problem with linear algebra is that, or in general, if I can solve the problem with the same time complexity as loading the data, so when it's linear in the data size, then I cannot get a quantum speed up because even the quantum computer has to load the data. So it works only when the, the matrix A is, is a matrix that is regular, that I can describe by, uh, by a mega, mega algorithm. And that was done, for example, for uh, <laughs> finite, 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 Displacement method, where you take a regular grid and look at the the scattering of waves of some object. In this case, you can describe the matrix algorithmically, and you have an efficient circuit for implementing the time evolution. So that's great. So here. We still have exponential speed up. Then the third step we had is check that the circuit depth is less than about 10 to the 14. For that problem, a group of research just looked into it and estimated to need about 10 to the 29 gate operations on, on I think, about 10 to the 27 qubits to solve a problem that a classical supercomputer can still solve within minutes. 10 to the 29 circuit depth, even if I assume a nanosecond logical gate time, is 10 to the 20 seconds, which is 10 to the 13 years. We will not wait that long. So the problem with linear algebra is it is extremely efficient to do that classically. When you have to load the data, then you've lost. When you can compute the matrix efficiently, then still the constants hurt us. So what that means is we have to look more closely. We have to make this effect of 10 to the 15 faster. So we should probably look at a different problem. And we have some problems in mind where it looks much better, so it seems feasible, but there we don't have an application yet of those matrices. So that's the next step here that we need, and of course we have a serious problem when we do that. And so what we should do, let me skip the next one. So we should actually go to problems that are easy on the quantum computer 
and hard classically. Linear algebra was too easy classically. Page rank was too easy classically. This is the data result is too easy. You want a hard problem. And here I show you the first 10 the mega computer programs that reached a performance of uh, say a petaflop, meaning like a 10 to the 15 op operations per second. This is basically the first five that reached that were all programs basically simulating materials, simulating chemistry, simulating quantum systems. So if the most of the si supercomputer use that we have on big machines is for simulating quantum systems, then that's the place where we have impact with quantum hardware if we can do it better. So, and that's also where Dr. Stuart Feynman mentioned that to simulate physics with computers, you better build quantum hardware. And so that's what I want to uh, talk about next. And there we have a uh, mega exponential speed up that's possible. So now let me, yeah. No, wha what I'm saying is when I have a quantum system that I want to simulate, that seems to be a really good application. Because it is hard classically, we're using half of uh, our gear, I think it's, it's super for a uh, uh, computer at the time for doing that. And we know from Feynman that it's easy to see quantumly. So here we have a problem that we know is hard classically, it uses big machines and we still can't solve it well enough. And in theory we know how to do it exponentially better on quantum hardware. So that seems to be a real killer app. Because here in this list, consciousness and AI, yes, we need to just try it out. That's, uh, that's worth doing. We can uh, just tell you try it. We can't tell you more yet. For the, the, the linear algebra, we still need to find something that is hard classically because most of the time it's too easy. If you, you have something that's super hard per, uh, per hardware that you can't do classically then, and you can do it quantumly, then maybe it's there. Drug design we discussed, which is not the problem of, of doing the chemistry right. Optimization maybe, cryptography is, a, is clear. But the uh, material science and chemistry seems to be the, 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 the hard problem and, and it fits well here because this is a physics summer school. And so for quantum physics problems, this seems to be the application. So now I next want to ask you how many of you already know about quantum computers, qubits, gates? Do you all know everything about that or not? You all know you, no, no. Do you know what a qubit is? Yeah, quantum gate, a little bit. Okay, so then what I want to do now is I want to show you how we can simulate the D-wave quantum annealer from yesterday on a quantum media computer and then we will map it later to chemistry problems, okay? And since you admitted that you don't know all about quantum gates, I want you to tell me when something is unclear. Promised? So what we had yesterday was the icing model in the transverse field. So we, we had a model where H was a sum over all spins I, a term sigma X, so sigma i x, 
with a constant minus gamma in front. And let us for now make it get make a time independent. Plus then we had a term uh, the sum over i less than j, a coupling j i j, and the sigma i c times sigma j c. And then I now want to start with some state psi, and I want, want to evolve it under h. So I want to apply extra uh, potential of minus i h p to that. And that is hard it's because if I do that, this is an uh, this is uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an mega 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 plus it's, uh, it's the operator acting on n qubits. So the bit only something that acts on one qubit or two qubits in my case. So I need to to simply simplify it, and I do that by splitting that into terms. Let me first look with just at the transverse field term. How can we evolve with exponential of minus i? Or then it's plus i gamma sum over my size i sigma I times p times sigma i x. This I can write as the product over all i, exponential of i gamma t times sigma i x. And so this is a product of commuting single spin terms, single qubit terms. And so I can just implement that. I have, uh, have uh, my state psi here. These are my qubits. A bit more space. And what I have to do is I have to do a rotation around the x axis for uh, uh, every single year qubit. So I have to rotate here. I'm going to draw it as the circuit. This is a rotation of the x axis by a certain year angle theta. And I do that everywhere, I of theta, do that on every qubit. So this is just a rotation on every qubit around the, 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 the x-axis. That's just because this is how that spin evolves in the field. So the nice thing here is basically because our quantum gates basically are quantum spins in fields, if you want to simulate a quantum spin in a field, it's trivial. Now, what is the angle theta? That's just a mega convention that the, the gate, gate uh, that the gate, that's for here, the gate R x of theta applies exponential of minus i theta sigma x over two. So theta then is minus twice the angle here. Theta is minus two gamma t. What if you don't have an X rotation on your machine? Let's say you only have a rotation around the C axis. What do you do then? Then you have to change bases. So you can write the, the gate, the, 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 the X rotation as the Hadamard gate that you may have heard about or not, have you? Yeah, no? Yes. Everyone? And then we've, we've switched, uh, switched mega, 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 X and C. And now we apply a C rotation, a C of theta, and then we again change the basis back with the, 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 the Hadamard gate. So that's easy. If I add to it, let's say I also add to it plus sum over i h i times sigma i c, that would be easy. This is just uh, the, 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 the c rotation. So if I have just that, it's also easy. Then let us look at this Ising term. 
so this is not as easy. So here there are two qubits involved, and now I would need a rotation. So here, for the Ising term, I need to do the product over i less than j of the exponential of now minus i j i j times t times sigma i z sigma j z. And so that's the unitary that I need to implement. And if, uh, let's say, I have my 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 four qubits here, I do the rotation between these these two here. I call them one, two, three, four. And here I do the rotation on one, two, and on three, four. And then I also need to do the one three, so how to uh, just draw that? The one three here, and at the same time I can do the two four. So here that's one three, that one two that, that x. So this is the r one three, and the r two four I can do at the same time. And then in my third step. I'm doing the the the, the two three, and I'm doing at the same time also the one four. So the R one four. And the other lines just go through underneath it. Let me stop the one two just to see. But now, how do I implement, let's say, the exponential of minus i j i j t times sigma i c sigma j c? So I have the qubit i coming in here, I have the qubit j coming in here. Now I want to do a circuit that implements that rotation. But they only have single qubit rotation. I don't have a rotation gate on the, the product of two of them. But what I can do is now I can basically compute the product. So what I can do is I can do a controlled NOS gate between the first and the second, between i and j. Then this here remains in the, s in the s so if this was in the basis state si and that was in sj, then this remains in si. And this here turns on to the basis state Si times Sj. Because if this was pointing down, then I flip it. And so with the, you see not now here, basically this qubit is in the state which is the product, and now I just do a rotation. So now all I have to do is a C rotation by a certain angle. Then after that, I have to undo that basis change by again doing a controlled NOS operation. do a C0 which turns this into the product, then I do the rotation, then I undo the basis chain. At the end of it, for a given basis state, that is still in the basis state Si and that is in the basis state Sj, but it's picked up a certain phase depending on i and j. The phase that I picked up is Si times Sj times the constant in front. It's because this operator is actually diagonal. Just sigma t. So, and, and these are basically, so this is basically the, the main trick we'll need. With that, we cannot do any quantum model. But so far we've done either the X rotation or the C rotation or the Ising term. I can do all of the X terms uh, at the, the same time because they, they commute. I can do all of the C fields 
and the, 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 the AC terms because they commute. But they want to evolve with the X and the C term and they don't commute. So the trick to that is cauterization. Is what I do. Yeah, if 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 it's it's if it's not CC, what do I do? What did I do with the rotation when I did not not have uh, uh, have uh, make up the C, 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 C rotation? I did the the Hadamard gate to switch to switch X to C. So all I need to do to do a term that is is X and X here. I put the harder mark in front here, here, and in the back here and here. So I change x to c, I apply the term, and I change it back. For the y, I change y to c, apply it, change it back. But a good point, you want to actually mention that later. It's great that you mention it now. So when when I have, for example, a uh, Heisenberg model, the Heisenberg spin model is h equal sum of i less than j some j i j times sigma i sigma j means i have so and this is sigma i x sigma j x plus sigma i y sigma j y plus sigma i c sigma j c we talked about the cc term for the xx term As I mentioned, we do that. We apply a Hadamard gate. Apply a Hadamard gate, and we do the same. We do the rotation here, and we undo the control knot, and we undo the Hadamard. For the the why why I take a gate. Uh, 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 the, the the switches switch up to 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 y and c the the the, the that the uh, uh, s gate and the the Hadamard gate. So it's just two basic changes to c and I apply. But again, this is only for a single of the terms. If I had only the x x term, or if I had only the y y term, but now I have all of them, and they don't commute. So I can't say I run for time t with the x term, then for time t with the y term, because it's not the same. So the basic idea is if I now have something like the exponential of minus i a plus b times the time t, I would love to write it as exponential of minus i a t and the exponential of minus i b t. I want to do them separately, but that's not the same. But when I choose a small time step epsilon, then this is approximately the same. And this is the same here, plus correction terms of order epsilon square. Or I can write that as exponential of minus i a over 2 epsilon exponential of minus i b epsilon, exponential of minus i a over 2 times epsilon, plus terms of order epsilon cubed. Or I can write it more complex with terms of order of epsilon to the fifth, or better even. So just use a small time step, and for a small time step, they almost commute. This is the Rotter Suzuki decomposition. It is called Rotter Suzuki everywhere except in Japan, where it is called Suzuki's Rotter. The original idea is due to Rotter and then the, the, the higher order, which are uh, formulas are due to, 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 to Suzuki. 
And yeah, he spent his life finding great applications for that and used them also in the uh, Mega Path integral Monte Carlo simulations that I mentioned uh, till yesterday. But then, about 20 years ago, we found ways of doing path integral Monte Carlo on lattices directly with an infinitesimally small time step, directly in uh, the continuous time when things just jump at certain times. When the time step goes to zero in that case, then I don't care which equation I use, it becomes trivial. So then I don't need these equations. When I gave a talk about that once in Tokyo, in, well, back in 97 or so, then Suzuki approached me and said he wants to learn more about that. And then I went there and I explained it to him and this group in two hours. And at the end, he said, well, that's really great that you can do it directly in uh, continuous time. But why would you do that if you have great equations that allow you to do it with a discrete time step? He said, well, the algorithm is, is easier, and I don't need this. <laughs> that's idea. So uh, he really spent decades on that, and he has great equations here that let us do that. So. That means what we do is basically we apply each of these terms one half. So we take the, 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 the time t, we split it into tiny time steps. Then we apply the x term, the y term, the c term, the x terms, the y terms, the c terms, terms, and so on. So basically, that's it. If you have the so IC model, you add it here. If you have the Heisenberg model, we add the x x term, the the, 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 the y y term. If we have a model a model of spin one particles, what do we do then? When we have a spin one quantum magnet, we have to represent the spin one as a sum of two spin twos, sorry, of two uh, two spin, two spin a half. And again, we apply the same back to x. If you want to do fermions, if you want to do bosons, that's a bit trickier. I can tell you now about fermions and then I think then it's time for a break. Are there any questions about that? So then let's do fermions. I want to leave this list here. Oh, and let's check what is the runtime of that. Basically, I need a certain number of time steps. I want to run for uh, some time t. The circuit depth for the transfer field term is 1. The circuit depth for the C field term is 1, because I can do all in mega parallel. The circuit depth for the JIJ term is n over 2 times five gates or so. So the total circuit depth is about maybe three times n. If I have a system like E wave wave with two thousand spins, well but it only connects always to six neighbors. So actually the circuit depth here is only about six times five or about thirty. So let's say the circuit depth is roughly a hundred for the uh, simulating E wave. I want to run it for a time t of about, let's say, 100 times the coupling, so 100 inverse phase. And now, how small do I need to make the time step uh, to epsilon? Empirically, we find that if I have an epsilon of about 0.01 j inverse, that's good enough. So I want to do about 10,000 time steps. Each one has about a hundred gate operations, so I have about a circuit depth of 10 to the 6. So we can do a gate in a, in a microsecond that takes a second. E wave does the same effector of 10,000 faster, but this approach is more flexible. Because I mentioned three problems yesterday. One problem I mentioned with D wave is the temperature and the errors and noise. 
This simulation I can start with in the ground state and evolve it without any errors I remain in the ground state. Another problem one had with any uh, analog hardware like D-Wave was the, 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 the calibration error. The couplings were uh, were known only to about about uh, about the three percent error. Here, if I can do the, 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 the rotation better, then that is gone the error. The third limitation was the fixed hardware graph. Here, I can do any coupling I want. So this is slower by constant, but it's much more flexible and it would not have the problem of D-Wave. It still has the problem that it scales the same way as my quantum Monte Carlo algorithm. So it does uh, not give us the quantum speed up, but at least I can simulate D-Wave without the problems of the uh, 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 log hardware. Now, how do we do fermions? And for that, let us first take a simple model of the, the, the spinless fermions. So we want to have the model H is a term minus T sum over I. I want to hop from a side I to a side I plus one. So it's just a 1D chain chain of the fermions. The CI dagger, CI plus one, plus the summation conjugate, and let me add a repulsion term V, sum over I between nearest neighbor fermion and I and K. And I want to represent that by qubits. So I want to say that the qubit state zero is just the empty site which was the, 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 the up spin and the down spin, the qubit state one is the occupied side. Then the, 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 the operator N in this case just becomes one half of one minus sigma IC. So that the, 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 the up spin is zero, the down spin is is one. Then how do I do the hopping terms? The 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 What we do there is, uh, there, are, uh, there are many approaches. The simplest is the, the, the jordan Wigner transformation. Is there anybody here who has not heard about jordan Wigner? There's somebody here. So what we basically have to do, so let me just, just may I tell you what it means in practice. If I have my chain of sites here. And if I want to move a fermion from here to there, if I want to hop from here to here, if I have a CI dagger CJ, then the sign of this matrix element will depend on how many fermions sit there in between. If there is one fermion here, then it's negative. When there are two fermions here, and I hope this, uh, this uh, over negative two fermions, then it's plus. When I have two hop over where three fermions, uh, then, I, uh, then, then I, I 
exchange fermions three times, then it's negative. So, so I have to calculate the parity of the fermions in between. So I can map generally C i dagger C j. I can map that to a sigma i plus. Uh, so no, so yeah. Uh, uh, sigma i minus because the creation means I flip the spin down then a sigma j plus and in between I have to count the parity of them so I have to get here the, here the parity of the spins in between no, of the particle numbers and that is just the product over k equal i plus 1 to k minus 1 of sigma i t. Just need to put a string of sigma on uh, sigma k t. So just need to put a string or a string of your sigma t's in between. So the, 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 the hopping term, which was the c dagger here, the c here, becomes a sigma minus here, a sigma c here, a sigma c here, a sigma c here, a sigma c here and then a sigma plus there. That way, I get the, the right phases and signs. So now I need to evolve in general with this term, which is now not just two spins, but it is five, six, seven, or more. But let us first look at the simple model here of the, 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 the nearest neighbor chain. In this case, I only hop from here to there, to there and those strings don't appear. So it's easy. In this case now, the model becomes just minus t sum over i to sigma i plus sigma j minus plus sigma j minus sigma i plus. That was this term here. And this term v sum over i and i and j. The sigma i plus sigma j minus sigma i minus sigma j plus, I can rewrite as sigma i x sigma j x plus sigma i minus sigma j minus with factors of two no, 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 x y plus sigma i y sigma j y with factors of two. I don't remember by heart now. One or two, I think, in front here. Yeah. Minus zero, two. I thought there was no zero. Thank you. So basically, I just have to rotate with an XX term, a YY term. Well, we did that before. We have those terms. That was the, 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 the XX one. Then, what about the, 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 the NI and J term? So it's just a one minus uh, uh, sigma i c times one minus uh, sigma j c. That gives the constant term. That's the global phase. I may ignore that or not. Then I have terms proportional to to sigma i c. Well, that's just the c rotation, and I have terms coming in that uh, that are sigma i c times sigma j c. Well, we also had that over there, the icing term. So we have all the terms. Now, the, the last thing I want to discuss is what if it's not a 1D chain? What if I really have to do this big string here? And what this is, is basically a string. Once I replace the minus plus plus minus by the, by the x's and y, y. And these are terms like sigma i x, sigma i plus 1c, sigma i plus 2c, and so on to sigma j minus 1c, sigma j x. How do I evolve with that? We know what to do with the axis. We just do a Hadamard gate. So let me maybe draw the circuit up here. So 
we have i here, a few more, we have k down here, it comes out here. So what we have to do first is we, we do a Hadamard gate on i and k. So at the end we undo the Hadamard gate on i and k. Now I have to evolve under sigma ic to sigma kc. So what I need to do is I need to calculate the product of all the the, all, uh, the values, and th and like there, I do that just by control naught. So I do the C naught here. Now this is this is like a sigma i times sigma i plus one. Do another control naught down here. Do another control naught down here. I do control naught down here. Then I do a rotation on the C axis, and then I now just undo all my control naught. to uncompute this product. And that's the term for the 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 the, 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 the XX part and then I do the YY part. What is the cost now? The cost now is the basically for uh, for uh, every hopping term I now have a, a circuit depth that is three plus two times the number of, so, uh, so, 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 which is here, three here plus two times the distance between i and k, k minus one. So it's the proportional to that distance. So it's still a pretty small number. What if we have been full fermions like in the Hubbard model? Who knows the Hubbard model? Who that left in the round? Who has not heard about the Hubble model yet? There must be somebody. Good. Since it's over there, let me sketch it over there. The Hubble model is the most simplified model of a strongly acting system, where I totally simplify the Coulomb term. So this is the model where H is, one term is the hopping term, term minus T, the sum over all neighbors I and K, and the sum over all spin sigma of the terms that is Ti sigma dagger Cj sigma plus Cj sigma dagger Ti sigma. So this is the term, uh, term uh, uh, that hops particles around in space. Plus, I have uh, this, 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 is this is the Bayesian term u. When two particles sit on the same side, so plus u sum over i, ni up, ni down. When there are, uh, when there's both an up and a down uh, electron on the same side, it costs energy U. The simplest interesting model for that is on a square lattice. The electrons hop between sides with T, and if there are and if there's if there's both an up and a down electron on the same side, it costs energy U. This is the most simplified model you can have of any material that contains both interactions and hopping dynamics. This model cannot be solved yet efficiently in two dimensions. In one dimension, it can be solved exactly the with the beta ansatz. In two dimensions, we don't know anything about it. Or we, we, we don't have any controlled approximation. We have lots of theories about it. There are about a thousand different Mitchell theories about it. There are about, about, about uh, 20 different numerical methods that partially start to agree now, but there are still many open questions. 
if you can solve the donut lattice of 30 times 30 sites, for which you need 2 times 30 squared qubits, so about, uh, about, mega, about mega, mega, 2,000 qubits, then I can apply this. I can do, do the U terms all in the, in the, in the parallel. I can do these hopping terms in parallel. I can do with tricks I'll mention later. I can do also do these terms in parallel. And I can do the odd and even in the so, so all these red ones. I can then parallel because they don't touch the, the same qubits and all of these green terms. So I have to split the hoppings into four terms. And I can do uh, the U terms in, in, uh, uh, in a parallel. The U terms give me a circuit depth of that constant about one for the, the C term, three for the C, C, C term. So that's a circuit depth of four. The hopping terms, I need to do four of them always. So it's four times, and each one gives me at most a circuit depth of 2n. So it's at most a circuit depth of roughly 10n. If n is about 1,000, it's a circuit depth of 10,000 per time step. If I have to do, n, if I have to, to do, do 10,000 time steps, it means the circuit depth is around, around 10 to the 8. If my machine runs with the logical gate time of a microsecond, I can solve the Hubbard model in two minutes. And we've done before lunch. With. On a classical computer, <laughs> we don't know how to solve it. So here's a clear example where we can solve problems that we cannot solve classically very easily once we have the have, have to make up this, the 2,000 qubits. And I want to, 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 to stop here. So that, that looked extremely nice. We can solve the Hubbard model. Now let me give you the preview of the next lecture. When I talk to a person in the material science, so that they would be excited if you give them a machine to solve the Hubbard model. Be it this or be it a uh, system of, system of like, ultra cold atoms in the uh, like optic lattice, then she told me she would not even read the paper because she's not interested in the, 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 like, uh, the, the Hubbard model because it describes no material. Then I challenged her that she likes to design materials. I said, why don't you design a material that describes the Hubbard model? And she found that great, and we worked on that. And we found this material that is well described by the Hubbard model. And this is now a solid state quantum simulator for quantum gases. Because it describes the Hubbard model. It's much, much faster. One can cool it much deeper. The problem is we could not grow the crystal yet. It's the fluoride, which is hard to grow. But once we have that, then we have the, the crystal. I can show you this is a quantum simulator for quantum gases. So to go to real materials, what it means is we have to go beyond that. We have to take into account the, the full band structure and the Coulomb interaction is not just local on one atom, it's long range. And that will be the challenge. Thank you. <laughs> Next question? Reading out, yes, there's a problem. Let's say I have a uh, linear system, and I solve it exponentially faster. Huh? The question is, what is the problem? So there is, so things uh, slow down when I have to load data. What about slow down if I have to read data? 
let's say I solve uh, this linear just system of equations, and then I have the, 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 the solution in my wave function, and I can can sample from it only. So if you want to actually read out the full vector, then I have to to do uh, then I have to, to run it with the exponent exponentially many times. Right, so there cannot be a speed up there at all. Now, that means the, the, the linear algebra is, n is not an application if you actually want to know the full vector. So it's only useful if you want to have a property of the vector that you can sample efficiently. In the, the, the example here that I uh, I showed what what one had the uh, 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 object that that looked like an airplane and the uh, and the 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 radar wave, and I didn't want to know what the the, the the wave looked like. I just wanted to know the, the scattering cross section. That the, the the few bits that I need to to, to get out. That's better. So you need to find a few bits only that you want to read out. Then you have to, 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 to transform the wave function in a way to read out just those few bits. And that's in general the big challenge of finding a good quantum algorithm because, because uh, deeply, if we say the quantum computer operates on all possible values simultaneously. So we have exponential speed ups. And yes, that's true, I can do that, but readout is limited. So the trick is how to reduce the wave function to something that, that when I read the few bits gives me something interesting. For chemistry and physics, that's not a problem because I can never look at the wave function anyway uh, in the lab, and so and I have the, 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 the wave function stored here. But the only quantity I'm really interested in is the energy, for example, or something that I can measure in the lab, like what is the density here? I just measure it. So whatever I measure in the lab, I can turn it to a circuit and measure the same thing that people in the lab measure. So it's easier for chemistry. But if I want the with the wave function, then it takes exponential time. Because I need to get out exponentially many numbers. Yeah. 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 So how do I, for example, get the count state? I discuss that in the next lecture. How to get an eigenstate? How to get a thermal state? How do I, yeah. Good point. We're coming to that. And then one problem is also w once I measure something, once I measure one qubit, the whole thing is destroyed. So now I need to start all over preparing it. And if that should take long time, okay, here it takes a minute or two. But now I want to measure many things accurately. Let's say I want to measure something to predefined the, 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 the digits. Now I need to run it a million times. And now I'm at two million minutes and it starts getting tricky again, right? There are ways of actually Fixing the error you do when you measure things in qubits. You measure it, and then after it, you just undo the measurement. There are tricks for that uh, that I can show. But those are, are things where we need mu much more help and new ideas for that. So yes, I can easily make the ground state of the upbar your model in minutes, I think. But then when I want to measure it, I need to measure it many times. An easy way is to uh, just 
build it, get me a cluster with one million quantum some CPUs instead of those classical cores. Right? It's just a big cluster and they run it in parallel. A big data center full of, of QPUs. When you include the, the errors because the, how the depth changes with the system size or it's just a constant? Uh, okay, so for a, a fixed size, the depth changes by constant. And for that, it depends on the quality of the qubit. Could be a factor 1,000, could be a factor 50 only. So when I say a microsecond logical gate time, that would mean that I need to do physical gate time measurements in 20 nanoseconds, maybe not realistic. So I think m more of the realistic might be a physical gate type time and measurements of a microsecond than a logical gate time of maybe a hundred microseconds. And with that, the time to do the Hubbard model now goes from two minutes to three hours, which is still the time between now and the next lecture. But now we see, okay, it, it's still nicely doable for that, but now if I want to measure that a million times, then yes, then I want my big cluster, because I don't want to wait three million hours, which is too long. But it's still doable. So that's then the step four, add the overhead of quantum error correction and lay out to a certain machine and see what it really takes on your machine. Because this is just a, this is just the, the, the upper bound that I have that, I do not, that I cannot imagine a quantum computer that I can build with current physics that would do anything with that with more gates than that. For the machines that I could imagine building now, I want to bring that down by a factor of 10,000. So then four, add the overhead of quantum error correction. And lay out. Layout meaning if my machine does not allow me keynote gates between qubits, then I have to move things around, swap them, teleport them, but also costs. So typically, this will add a cost in time of about a factor of 100 or more. It will add a cost in space of anywhere between maybe a factor of 30 and a factor of 10,000. We have worked it out for chemistry, and what I will show you then is that it really, really convinces me that we need super good qubits if you want to do chemistry. But that's the end of the next lecture. <laughs>